Welcome. Glad to be with you today. Here things have been going really well, so that's, that's fun. Hope you've had a good time. Sounds like you'll all be filling out your surveys. Um, <laughs> my name is Corey Conrad. I'm the Google.org project lead for Flu Trends. I've been with Google.org uh, now for about two and a half years, and before coming here, worked on pediatric HIV AIDS care and treatment in Rwanda for about a year, working closely with the Rwandan government. Um, I have a Master's of public, public Affairs from Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School. So that's more my background. But I work closely with a, a team of engineers, a statistician, and uh, a couple of others on flu trends. So quickly, um, during this lightning talk, this is kind of the structure that I'll be going through. I'll give you an overview of flu um, and why it matters. And then we'll really delve more into some of the details about um, flu trends, our methodology, and our models. And then talk about some of the recent additions that we've added to flu trends. So what's the problem? Well, maybe you heard a little bit from Jacqueline Fuller yesterday about influenza and some of our work in Mexico. Um, but seasonal flu is it's a big deal. It affects millions of people around the world every year. Hundreds of thousands of people die. Um, as we all now know very readily, pandemic flu is a real and present threat. Um, novel H1N1 has spread across the globe. And the challenge is, is often that traditional surveillance takes time. Um, there are kind of two main ways that influenza surveillance may occur in a country or a place. Um, one of these ways is more of a, a symptom-based surveillance, often called ILI, or influenza-like illness, as the indicator. This tends to be a fraction of patient visits, um, patients presenting to a doctor who have flu symptoms, over the total number of patients that that doctor may see. This makes up what would be a sentinel surveillance network. In the United States, we have uh, over 1,000 doctors that are involved and physicians involved in um, a sentinel surveillance network like this based on symptoms. And then um, a second form is often um, called virologic, or it's based on lab data. So lab-confirmed um, strains of influenza, blood testing. This analysis just takes time, and this can delay a response by days or even weeks. So what do we have to offer then as, as Google.org um, to this challenge? Well, our team has found a close relationship between how many people search for flu-related topics and actual seasonal flu activity, um, how many people actually have flu symptoms. So some search queries tend to be popular exactly when um, seasonal flu is happening. And uh, by training our models over multiple seasons, we're able to control and filter for news-driven terms that may have been popular one season but not the next, or uh, regionally as well, may have been popular in one place but not another. And so by using aggregated search data, uh, we can estimate the current flu activity level in different countries around the world, um, basically and you know, effectively providing a multinational um, near real-time flu tracking system. This is simply an additional tool in the flu surveillance toolkit. It's not meant to be a replacement for the traditional surveillance I was explaining to you, which is based on real symptoms and actual doctor analysis and um, lab-confirmed data. But it does offer an additional, an additional and potentially useful signal. So let's delve now a little deeper on some of the details of flu trends and, and our methodology. Um, this portion of the presentation is taken from a paper published by uh, many members of our team in November of last year in collaboration with some of our colleagues at the United States Center for Disease Control. And we'll start with some stuff you probably already know, but um, basically health-seeking behavior, online health-seeking behavior exists. People look for health information online. Um, the stat's a little bit dated, but and it's, it's only for the U.S., but over 90 million people searching for online health information in the U.S. a year. Um, we can aggregate uh, this data and, and process it quickly here. And we know that users may consult search engines prior to a physician visit. So um, Dr. Google, if you will. One of the challenges, though, is knowing what people actually search for when they're sick. Um, and there are a couple of things that you could do to try and determine what people might search for. You could guess. You can make some educated guesses. You could use ontologies or medical dictionaries or actual symptoms that you think people might have. But this is, this is tricky because often 
um, queries are issued in very creative ways, in ways that you might not guess. And they are also influenced by media. So let's say your favorite basketball player has the flu, and you're curious about that. Or a company um, closes down for temporarily because people are sick. This would influence what people search for as well. So we took a rather naive approach. Um, we looked for search queries that basically, uh, who had popular, whose popularity varied according to the historic surveillance data. So we obtained historic surveillance data, which is publicly available from the Centers for Disease Control for the nine regions across the United States. And we tried to pick the queries then that fit that curve. We used uh, Google's wonderful computing power to be able to do this and compared each of these candidate search queries from our database against the historic data that we had from CDC. It's worth noting that we didn't pre-filter anything from this database, so Britney Spears was just as likely to show up or just as eligible as flu. And then we, um, once we identified the queries we, that had the best fit for the ILI data, we combined them by summing them together. So we had a single predictive aggregate variable. And our model is designed to then estimate the probability that a random physician visit is ILI related. The sole input variable is the probability that a random search query is deemed to be ILI related. So we take the queries which best fit the historic ILI data, we sum them together, we divide them by the total number of web search queries observed each week to get a probability or a percentage. And this is the data that's then av available, our estimates are available from download for download from our website, which I'll show you momentarily. So it's pretty straightforward. It's a pretty simple methodology, really. And then we separately tested each of the 50 million candidate queries by measuring how well um, a model based on each query could predict out of sample data points. So this is a, called cross validation. And since the US CDC provided data for nine multi state regions, um, we fit the models using the ILI percentages going back to 2003 <coughs> across these different regions. <coughs> Excuse me. You had the flu? <laughs> I don't think so. So the, the database um, has, uh, for, for various countries, it has a, across countries, across states. So for the United States, the queries that showed up were specific geolocated within the United States. Is that the? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so our model was validated for each of the nine regions. So for each region, it's a model specific to that region. So it's fit to the, the data for that region from CDC. OK, maybe we can, we can get back to it after. And I'll make sure I've given the best answer I can. Um, so the topics that, that we found then, fortunately, the top 45 uh, queries were in the topics here on the left. Um, and they were all influenza related. So phew, that, was, that was a good thing. Um, the, the next 55 were not so influenza related. So um, actually, I think you can see that here. Um, the the drop off that happens here at 81 was Oscar nominations. Um, in the top 100, high school basketball did show up. But the, the top 45 were all flu related. These tended to include things like complications, remedies, symptoms. Um, and you can access more of this um, from the Nature paper available on, on flu trend, the FluTrends website. So as the 2007-2008 season started, we watched with anticipation uh, the Google flu trends data. The trend line is in blue here, and CDC is in orange. And on January 28th, we detected a significant increase in flu activity. This is kind of two weeks ahead of where the CDC was in their reporting at that time, and so we had our fingers crossed, hoping that, okay, <laughs> we're putting ourselves out there. Let's, let's hope that this is accurate. And in fact, as we watched for the rest of that season, uh, we tracked quite nicely with the CDC data. Yeah? I just wanted to point out the two examples that you showed mm -hmm. from high school, high school basketball and Oscar nominations. Mm -hmm. have the same season pattern mm -hmm. as flu. 
Yes. So that's a good example of correlation without causality. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's why it's, it was important to have the the, the seasonal um, data from multiple regions because a peak in one region would be at one time, a peak in another region would be at a different time. So across space and time, you're actually then able to kind of filter these queries that may have been popular in one place at one time, or you know one season but not the next. Um, so both the geographic and the the, t the time space time differential piece was important. So this is what our website looked like. This is a screenshot from February um, at about what, what was actually the peak of our season um, for seasonal flu here nationally. And you know we were trying to make this user friendly and nice to look at. And I like the colors. You have a chart here from kind of minimal to intense, from green to red. Um, but I think definitely the most beautiful part for our engineers and perhaps for you was this. So beautiful, raw, tabular data, freely available for analysis and download in a CSV file from the website. And this is what um, our correlation looked like for this last season. So the first four peaks here, um, from left to right, are the, the training data or the, what the model was validated against. And then the, 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 high, the second to the left here, the higher peak, um, was the the season um, that was the holdout. So we were actually seeing how our model performed. And then the 2009 season was this last season. You can see that it didn't correlate quite as well as the season before, um, but still doing quite well. This is for one of the nine regions, the West North Central region. Um, this wasn't our, our best fit. It wasn't our worst fit. It was kind of in the middle. Um, so we thought it was more or less representative. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, this is actually, uh, oh, that's a good point. Yeah, we didn't, for this region, the, um, we had the peak, we didn't identify as exactly the same for West North Central. That's true. The previous season, though, so this is looking back over the, the, the leading is on reporting time. So at the end of a season, you'll have all of the data that has been reported throughout the season, and you'll just line up your curves. So you don't necessarily see the timeliness piece at the end of a season. Um, but the difference in peaks is, is an interesting and curious thing for sure. Yeah. That's, that's a good question. Um, that isn't something that we have really um, looked at specifically in the United States. But for an example, I'll give you um, in the next few slides for Australia, that's exactly what we did. Um, so let's, let's get to that. So recent additions. This is what our current, um, this was a screenshot from just a couple days ago. We've got our southern hemisphere countries on top and our northern hemisphere countries on the bottom. It's flu season right now in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and so um, we'll look at these a little bit more closely. Australia, I just mentioned. So for Australia, there was data publicly available for the state of Victoria, which is the state in the bottom right-hand corner of Australia here. And um, we then took the data for Victoria and validated a model against that and applied that model to the whole country. Um, and for other states in the country. For some of the states, they didn't have publicly available data or the data just didn't exist. Um, and so this is a bit of, a, this is more to your, your question. This is an example where we did validate a model against one place and we'll be watching this season to do a retrospective analysis where other data is available to see, okay, how well did we do for other states in, in Australia, other territories? And for the Victorian Infectious Diseases Reference Laboratory, whose public data I mentioned we used, um, I got an email just a few weeks ago from the head of epidemiology there. He was so excited. He said, oh, you've detected this downturn, and our data is showing the same thing. And so we're now included in the Vidral a weekly official report uh, with a Google flu trends analysis there in the bottom, which uh, was kind of exciting for us. And you can see that we had this downward turn, and the, the data at the top there from Vidral is actually lab-confirmed data, but also showing the decrease starting at around the same time as we did. 
So this is more anecdotal, but we'll be looking more specifically at, at data analysis here at the end of the season. And then for New Zealand, um, I had received a, um, an email from the head of surve influenza surveillance there saying, hey, this is in November of last year, hey, I see that you've launched this for the United States. Could you do something similar for New Zealand? And so we kind of began to research um, using uh, data from the World Health Organization's National Influenza Center in New Zealand, the New Zealand Ministry of Health, what might be possible there. And we're able to provide estimates for both North and South Island. So again, at the end of the season, we'll be looking to see how well we did in comparison with their data. And then finally, experimental flu trends for Mexico. So this methodology is different from, from some of the previous examples that I've given. Um, for Mexico, we did not have historic data. And so um, we actually hadn't also been looking at Mexico. We uh, were contacted by some of our colleagues at the US CDC the week of April 20th. They said, um, we're seeing some interesting activity. We've identified a few cases of this new virus in California. Can you look and see what's going on in Mexico with flu-related search activity? Well, we hadn't been looking at Mexico. We didn't have a model for Mexico, but we said, OK, we'll see, we'll see what we can do. Um, and by taking some of the terms from the English model um, and translating those into Spanish, or by taking some of the Spanish terms that hadn't made it into the English model, but because we have a Spanish-speaking population in this country, we were able to have an idea of what those terms might be. Um, by some of the other research we've been doing, we, we kind of took this basket of terms that were flu-related in Spanish and applied those to Mexico to see what sort of trend it yielded. And it did have a seasonal curve over multiple years, and it was showing an uptick in April. And so we said, OK, in conversations with um, some of the Mexican government officials that were responding at that time and our US CDC colleagues, we would work to pull out a, build out an experimental model for Mexico and turn that around quickly. So we launched for Mexico um, the last week of, of April and were able to provide state level data um, with this experimental methodology for about 16 states in Mexico. So going forward, we're working on adding more countries. Um, and um, I think we'll have a little bit more time for additional questions after. Um, but you can always contact me at cconrad at uh, google.com with further comments. Do we have time for one more question now, Bronner? One more? OK, in the back. That's a good idea. I'll, I'll have to see who we can talk to about that. Can we just put a, a button on the, the Google search? <laughs> I'm feeling unlucky. Nice. That's a good one. All right. Thanks so much. One more question? OK. Yeah. Yeah, that's also a really good question and one that we're continuing to think about. Um, I think influenza, in many ways, was kind of a low-hanging fruit. Um, it had this nice seasonal pattern. There tends to be data collected on this um, you know, over many years and many places. So you actually have a nice golden data set that you can compare against. Because it um, affects so many people, I mean, we're talking millions and millions and hundreds of thousands dying. We've got enough of a threshold that we think we could pick up some aggregated activity that shows this trend. So something like E. coli or foodborne outbreaks or things that don't have this sort of pattern and don't affect as many people, I think are going to be more challenging. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep you posted. Nothing, nothing yet, but um, yeah. OK, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.